loves CBT. In his free time, he loves climbing, although this has cost him a nasty fall or two. Speaking of falls, before we jump into things, some recommendations for making the best out of this session. All chat conversations and Q&A will take place in the Coalesce DBT and data channel of DBT Slack. This allows us the chance to connect with the remote attendees tuning in from around the world. If you're not part of the DBT community Slack, you have time to join right now. Visit community.getdbt.com and search for Coalesce DBT and data when you enter the space. If you already joined the Slack channel, please take a second to introduce yourself and connect with other community members in Slack. New Orleans attendees, please be aware that we are 30 seconds ahead of the folks watching online, so please try your best to refrain from sharing spoilers in the chat. After the session, Guillermo will join the Slack channel for one or two hours to answer your questions. However, we encourage you to ask them right now at any point during the session. Let's get started. Over to you, Guillermo. Thanks, Amada. Um, thanks for the intro. Um, so hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Guillermo, as you already know. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, DBT and data mesh, and whether this can be the perfect pair or not. Uh, of course, um, this is quite a, a, an interesting thing, data mesh, right? It's an interesting title. Probably some of you have heard of it, some of you haven't. Uh, so we're going to discuss it today a little bit. So uh, we can see whether it can be a fit for your company or uh, your use case or not. Um, so first, I was going to talk a little bit about me, but I've been already introduced, so let's just skip that. Uh, I'm from Madrid, Spain, of course, uh, but I'm the tech lead at GoData Driven. So GoData Driven is a consultancy company. We do a lot of these uh, architecture designs, data platform implementations, um, yeah, and I'm the tech lead of the analytics engineering unit there. We've grown quite a, a lot in the last uh, couple of years, a lot of analytics engineer, engineers now. Uh, we're based in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and yeah, this is just a picture of me climbing, just because I wanted to look fancy. Uh, yeah, so about the talk, just so that you know what to expect, I will first discuss a little bit what is the history of data teams, because this is important context to understand data mesh, right? Uh, you have this before DBT and after DBT. Uh, I make it really sound that dramatic. It's probably not, but uh, let's think that it is. Uh, then I will go into a brief data mesh recap. So basically, uh, you will probably know something about data mesh if you're in this talk, or maybe not, but in the case that you don't know uh, something about data mesh, I will briefly touch upon uh, what is data mesh. And uh, of course, afterwards, we will go about discussing what data mesh and DBT can be, uh, and whether this could be a good fit for the, in the conclusions. The Q&A will take part in the Slack channel, so you can forget that. Uh, yeah, so let's go into the history of data teams. Um, so history of data teams uh, can go a long way back, but uh, we're not going to go as back as the guy with the mustache here. Uh, we will start in central team all the stack, as I like to call it. Uh, you usually have a team maybe running some sort of a SQL server, Oracle uh, data warehouse, or maybe they were actually doing bigger data. Maybe they were already introduced to the Hadoop ecosystem, so they were maybe using tools like Hive or Pig, MapReduce. Uh, and the usual thing that uh, you used to see here is that you get a lot of requests in, so there's still a lot of demand uh, to get data products out, so I need new data, I need new insights, I need new dashboards, uh, but the time to market was really slow, and this was mainly because there was a lot of maintainability issues with this technology. So 80% of the time is uh, focused on maintainability, uh, the technology is quite difficult to operate, and <laughs> This is from uh, own experience. The documentation is usually quite poor. Uh, we know this because we've done some migrations. And <laughs> yeah, there's no documentation. Um, so yeah, this is like the first paradigm. Then we have like the new sort of paradigm with the modern data stack. Um, and yeah, this, this changes things quite a lot, right? You have a central data team, yes, that's the same. But you have a new stack. You have DBT, you have uh, tools like maybe uh, Databricks, Snowflake, BigQuery. So these big data warehouse, lake house kind of platforms that support all these workloads, they are easier to operate. So this creates faster time to market. Uh, you, um, as I said, it's easier to operate, right? You have compute and storage together, makes things easier. And because you're using DBT, and we all love DBT, the documentation is better, the visibility is uh, way better for, uh, 
for people outside of the, uh, of the, of the data domain to understand uh, you know, what is going on. You have this documentation, right, that you can publish to a catalog. So things are quite nicer, let's say, but it's still not super nice. And why is that? Because it doesn't still scale enough, right? You have a lot of requests coming in and you just have one central data team trying to serve all these different domains like finance, marketing, right? They are requesting their data, their insights, their dashboards, and you're just one team trying to produce everything. And this is quite difficult to do. And the other really important point is that there's no business domain expertise. And I consider that to be quite a big problem, right? Because you have a central data team that doesn't have expertise in uh, you know, particular domains, like maybe they're not experts in finance or in marketing uh, because they never done digital marketing campaigns or whatever. Uh, so so they, they're trying to uh, model the data of a domain that they, don't, they do not belong to. So what is the next thing that we try to do so, to solve these two problems? We try to open up the DBT repo to the rest of the company. And this is something that uh, I've already seen quite some clients doing this. Uh, and why, why is this nice? So now what you get is that different domains, right, that have their own analyst, maybe they are trained into uh, how to use DBT. And what you do is that you have still this DBT monolith repo, but you allow this analyst to commit to the repository. So that means that, uh, you know, if I'm a marketing analyst and I want a new data model to be uh, populated so that I can consume uh, my new dashboard, then what I do is instead of making a request, I make a commit myself to the DBT project. This is quite nice because you get things done and the business domain knowledge actually uh, transpires, right? Because you do know what you want, you do understand the data, uh, and you get what you want faster. What is the problem of this? You still have a central data team that is maintaining this DBT monolith, right? So you have these really painful CI/CD runs that take ages to run. Maybe you use deferral or some new feature like that. For sure you can do that, but it's still painful. Uh, the latency of runs can be quite big because you have more than thousands of models. And you have all these conflicts problems. You need to uh, uh, approve all these pull requests from all the domains. Um, so it can become quite a problem uh, for the central data team. So central data team is trying to maintain this repository, uh, but if you get 20 PRs a day, then at the end of the week you have 80 PRs that you have to approve. All, all of them need to pass the CICD. Uh, how do you do this? It, it becomes really uh, quite a mess. And I think another problem is the ownership uh, part, of course. Uh, so there's a lot of people that maybe make these commits and create new tables, but uh, do they actually follow up on that? If, it's, uh, if these uh, assets are stale, do they still follow up on this and, and maybe clean up the warehouse? So I think the ownership part is a little bit unclear too. So we're trying to solve yet this problem. So we move to another uh, possibility. And this is starting to look a little bit closer to data mess, as we will see later, right? So you have this shared DBT repository, and this is a central DBT repo. And this is still maintained by a central data team. And what this central data team does is that they provide some sort of sources, models, and macros that can be reused across, um, across these different domains, right? Um, and these different domains, right, so domain one, domain two, domain three, they import this uh, shared repo as a package so they can populate all these, uh, all these objects, right? This is something that, by the way, is recommended uh, by DBT. It's a good practice, right, that they recommend so that you can split the monolith. Uh, but this still creates quite some problems, right? So the first is what does go into this shared repo? Do we only provide sources and macros? Do we also provide core models? Um, who maintains this repo? So is there still a central dependency on a team to maintain this shared repository? And the third problem is the permissions and the governance, right? Because this explains how you can share uh, repos as a package, right? But what about the underlying data and the access to that data? Uh, does any domain get access to all the data in the server repository with all the sources from the company? So all these problems are still unanswered in this part. So that's where data mesh comes in. So we're going to uh, drift away a little bit and go into what data mesh is so that you can get a context of how it could work with DBT together. Um, yeah, so this is all inspired, by the way, by the articles from uh, Samak. Uh, she's the creator of the data mesh. Uh, but of course, it has my own twist, so I do my own interpretations. I will allow myself to do that, I guess. Um, so first thing that we need to discuss about data mesh, actually let me go back before we even see this, 
is that data mesh, let's say the way I see it, is a, a, a SAMAC identified as a series of problems that an organization has, particularly the data organization, and she provides some principles or guidelines to solve these uh, problems. And this is where I stop, right? So for me, these principles and guidelines are quite nice ways. Uh, basically, you interpret these principles, and then you decide how to move on with your data organization. How do you want to structure your teams, and maybe how do you want to go about your data architecture? Uh, but for me, this is all it is, right? So it's always open to interpretation, and there's no single technology that is answered by this data mesh. Uh, I don't think that's the case, at least. Um, so what problems does it try to solve? That's the first thing. So first problem does it try to solve, we already discussed, central data and platform team, right? So they receive a lot, a lot of requests. They still cannot scale. They don't have the domain business expertise. We've already discussed this. This is one of the problems that she also sees. The second problem is the pipeline decomposition. I find this one really funny, by the way. I don't know if you've ever uh, worked with a company or a client that, is, that does things like this. I've had this uh, situation before. So you have this decomposition where different teams take different ownership of parts of the pipeline, right? So you have this team that does specific ingestion or integration layer, right? And you have another team that does core transformations. Then you have another team that does smart transformations. Maybe another team does data quality. And what you're doing basically is you're decomposing the whole value chain of, of data pipelines in separate teams. So what you're creating is just an amount of dependencies that are going to just slow down the company quite a lot. So this is quite a big issue. And the third problem is the data organization structure. Um, and here we have, like, let's say, we classify it in, in three sort of uh, groups. We have the data producers, which can be the operating systems maintainers. So this can be either uh, some microservices that your company needs to run their, their operating systems. Maybe it can be also the case that uh, this is your Salesforce sales cloud or uh, whatever other system that you're using. And uh, what happens sometimes, particularly with the custom systems, uh, and maybe if you use Fivetran and you use uh, everything is a SaaS application, this is awesome, <laughs> but uh, many of our clients do not have this sort of uh, paradigm, right? They have their own applications, and they have this really ugly data that they just dump into the platform, or it, this is data is ingested into the platform. And there is this central data team trying to make sense of all this terribly ugly data, uh, trying to clean it up, making it into a format, that can be consumed by a data consumer, right? Uh, they design all these core models. Everything uh, they try to do is uh, absolutely great, but they try, they try, they try, but they are really slow at it, and they also don't have the domain expertise that the data consumers have. And the data consumers are just mad, basically, because they are waiting and waiting, and their data is never getting there. So these are the three main problems uh, that the data mesh discusses. Let's see what are the principles and guidelines that are proposed to try to solve these problems. So the first one is go domain driven. So uh, if somebody here comes from the software uh, engineering background, uh, you probably know that domain driven is something that uh, was discussed uh, also in the, in the DevOps software engineering uh, track. And uh, this was also done sort of to, to solve certain problems around uh, the way the organization was structured. And the idea of uh, the data mesh uh, domains is that you have two types of domains. Uh, one of them is the source aligned domains. And these source aligned domains basically are the, the domains that are closer to the operating systems. And they're in charge of making this data available in a way that is standardized according to data mesh. And this is really important. Eh? It's not the same as before. It's not just dumping ugly data. It's data that uh, agrees to a certain standard or to a certain data contract. Uh, the second type of domain is the consumer-aligned domains. So we can see these domains as they do not generate data, but they just consume data. And here we can have I don't know, our marketing uh, domain, finance, sales. I'm just making uh, common names of domains because this is a thing that is going to be better understood probably. But you can also have a Spotify type of domains, right? Um, yeah, the second really important point is treat domain data as a product. So within these domains, right? each domain should treat this data as a product. Um, and this means that it should be guided by standards. Uh, and so guided by standards mean there's a standard way of exposing these data products outside of the domain. Uh, they should be owned, that already sold because it's owned by the domain, right? Uh, they should be discoverable, so there should be a way in which another domain should be able to access these data products, or at least access the metadata so that they know that they exist. This is usually via data catalog, right, that we publish to. 
and they should be self-describing so that um, you can actually understand, you know, if you find a certain table, like a facts uh, orders kind of table, right, you do understand what it means because it's self-described. And the third point is to have a self-share platform. And what this does basically is that you have some sort of set of resources that you share across domains. And this helps quite a lot because domains do not have to have, do not need to host their own infrastructure, but they can actually use uh, the common infrastructure uh, provided by this data platform team. So the, the, the classic centralized team, it's not anymore about uh, doing the data transformations part, right, or the ingestions. It's only about providing the infrastructure that is required to run this platform. This could include permissions as well, hosting the data catalog, etc. And the fourth point is the federated governance. And this point is uh, more uh, sort of like overarching governance so that you don't go mayhem completely. So you have these specific gui guidelines or golden paths that the domain should uh, uh, comply with. Uh, there should be also standards for interoperability. So this is what we discuss as the data contracts. And you try to keep most of the decisions at the domain level because you don't want to impose decisions, right? That's also the important thing about a data mesh. You should have guidelines and maybe standards, but you shouldn't force the domains to use a certain tool or do things in a certain way because that's not the way it's supposed to be, right? They should have their own autonomy if they comply to these standards or guidelines that we described before. Um, yeah. Okay. So now I hope you got a little bit of a sense of what uh, data mesh is. Uh, so now we're going to discuss why and how DBT and data mesh can work together. And yeah. Um, so the first part I think that is important to define here is that um, this is a way of operating uh, data mesh together with DBT. It doesn't really mean that it's the only way, right? It also doesn't mean that you need DBT to run your data mesh. Uh, but this is basically just a way in which you can go about it, right, in your own organization. And also an important thing that you should know, right, is that if your organization structure is not set up for this, it's uh, not going to work anyway, right? <laughs> because you do need to have, like, clear boundaries in the domains and you need to have this, uh, yeah, let's say, separation of concerns so that the domains can actually be independent. Um, so why DBT and data mesh? First question that we try to answer. First of all, we want to get rid of all central dependencies. The only central dependency would be a central uh, data platform team, yes, but we don't have, uh, again, dependencies on uh, some other team that needs to, um, let's say, uh, expose certain data in a certain, uh, we don't have this server repository that we were discussing before, right, where we still depend on a central team to maintain this repo and expose certain things. So we just get rid of all of this and we just say every domain is its own. Uh, then the second thing is that we try to clarify ownership, right, of data products via shared standard metadata definitions. And DBT already allows you to do this, right? So it's really something that goes well together because DBT already has a metadata model uh, attached to it. And this makes uh, um, uh, the definition of data contracts way easier. This we will discuss in the next slide. But. And the third point is that you create a clear standard contract for sharing data using this uh, metadata model. And this is how high over it would look like, right, in a data mesh. You have some domain that exposes some data and then some other domain that consumes this data. And in the middle is what we declare as a domain boundary that go governed uh, by the contract standard that you define, right? Uh, so you should define some standards in this boundary. And this is what we... Uh, well, I think that DBT is actually really good at, right, defining some, some sort of a standard around your data, data products. So is it magic? Uh, well, it's not magic, obviously, so you need to do something about it to make this work. And here now I'm going to basically mention something that could help out uh, um, to define basically a DBT data mesh kind of implementation. So for me, it's as simple as a pair of exposures and sources together. So uh, let's, let's say that you have a domain A, right? And this domain has a DBT project, has some sources, some models, and then it has exposure. Um, and this exposure is basically pointing to another domain that wants to consume this data. Uh, so in this case, uh, domain B that wants to consume the model 
that is exposed from domain A will get a source that points to this specific uh, exposure. And therefore, you have this data contract that is, uh, in, that is represented by an exposure object in DVD and a source object on the domain B side. So this is your data contract. So some rules of the game, let's say. Only exposures can be consumed outside of the domain. Uh, why is this important? Uh, because otherwise this doesn't work. There's no data contract if you don't define exposure to clarify uh, what can be consumed outside of the domain. Um, as much exposures as domains that are consuming this data set. What does this mean? If you have also domain C that wants to consume this same uh, model from domain A, you need to define another exposure because a contract is defined with a source exposure pair. And the third point is the exposure needs to be populated as a source in the consumer project. What does this mean, of course, is that you need to complete the contract and you need to complete the contract in a nice way so that uh, you, know, you are exposing something, but you need to indicate in this source where you're pointing to. Um, yeah, so let's dive a little bit deeper, right? Is it this simple? It's probably not this simple. You need to do something always. There's always something under the hood that needs to work. And here I have like a really, really simple way of uh, going about it. So you have this new exposure that is merged, right, in the domain A uh, repo. And then what you do is that under the hood, you sync uh, uh, this, uh, this exposure with uh, the destination repository. So this could mean, for example, you create another pull request automatically in your CICD pipeline that creates uh, a source in the destination repository. Um, afterwards, of course, you need some sort of process that updates the permissions of this specific, uh, of this specific data set. And this means that uh, this, this step is obviously um, technology specific. So if you're using Snowflake, you need to grant the specific access in the Snowflake. If you're using Databricks, you should use Unity Catalog probably to grant this access. So this is obviously backend dependent, let's say. Yeah. So. I think uh, we've already covered quite a lot, actually, in a short amount of time. Um, so yeah, I think, I think the, the whole talk is a little bit, it goes from uh, why uh, we may need a data mess, right? If we're working with DBT, we sort of follow the steps. Uh, now, I think we understood why data mess is important um, and how it can work with DBT, but it's also quite important to discuss some sort of conclusions of whether this is something that could work for your company, yes or no. Um, so yeah, let's, let's see that. So should you consider it? Ah, this really depends on you, right? <laughs> but if you're considering data mess and are already using DBT, maybe this is a good way to go, right? Um, of course, uh, DBT needs to be used in a standard way across your projects, but these standards you can define in this federated governance kind of a structure. The second point is if you outgrew the DBT monolith, then uh, you may consider this shared repo approach, um, but I actually think it lacks the separation of concerns that, it, that data mess has, right? If you, consider it, if you consider the full separation of concerns, I think you can succeed a little bit better. Uh, third point is that if you're already using the shared repo approach and you, uh, you feel some of the pains of this uh, approach, then you can for sure go to, to a more decentralized kind of setup. Um, yeah, some of the cons of the DBT mesh approach. Yeah, I think data mesh can be really scary from a governance point of view. So, um, of course, data mesh means really you're giving uh, the domains quite a lot of um, range of motion, so they can do quite some things. They're still limited by the design of the platform that you're serving to them, but still they can do quite some things. And I understand that this can be scary for, for certain companies that want to centralize the way things are done and are scared, for example, of, uh, I don't know, data leaks or stuff like that, or the way certain domains treat PII data. So I can understand how this can be a little bit complex. Uh, and there's another point, which is the, this particular approach, expect that you're using DBT in most of the domains. And I think this is really forcing people into using DBT uh, into all the domains, because it does require, so these data contracts require that you're using DBT so that this actually makes sense, right? So if you don't have DBT, then you have a source and you have exposure, but uh, who's going to consume this source if you're not using DBT in the first place? So you can still do this, but it will be a bit weird, let's say. 
And the th third point is that it requires sub setup, right? So this is, uh, as I told you before, I think if you want to create a data mesh, it will require some sort of setup. It will be like that because there's no technology that creates a data mesh, right? You, you create it yourself by your own vision and the way you think it will fit in your company. Um, yeah, so let's say this could be a con, but it's also something that makes a little bit of logical sense. Yeah, I think uh, this, is, uh, this is it uh, for the talk. Uh, of course, there will be a Q&A afterwards. Uh, so if you have doubts, I think this talk is actually something that can generate a lot of doubts and maybe interest, but also like a little bit of a weird interest because it's, uh, it's quite a new thing. Uh, so please feel free to uh, ask on the Slack, but also just come reach out to me later and let me know. Um, and yeah, it was a pleasure to talk to you and uh, see you around in Colest. Thank you.